Hello everyone, so in this third lecture in optimization we covered two topics. We covered genetic programming and evolutionary programming. Now in this condensed form of the lecture we're going to have a specific look at genetic programming and then in the next video we'll cover evolutionary programming. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, so genetic programming can be seen as a specialization of genetic algorithms. It follows that pattern pretty much exactly. The only difference being is in the representation where instead of uh, using a bind bit string or an array of let's say floats or integers we use trees to represent the individuals it was initially developed to evolve computer programs where the program output was then used as the measure of fitness so GPS is then used to evolve executable computer programs where each individual then represents one such program and it's represented by a tree of course now this has a number of implications or two main implications the first is that we have adaptive individuals GAs usually have a fixed size representation and let's say for example it's a tenth dimension problem where there's ten variables to optimize you, you might end up with an array of ten floats or if you use a binary uh, representation or a bit stream with three bits for each dimension you have 30 fixed bits to represent each individual with uh, genetic programming you have a tree the tree might start very small and then grow in size over time or shrink even secondly you need a domain specific grammar so a grammar needs to be defined for the problem to be solved in other words what's meant with this grammar is this is the computer language that needs to be represented by the tree that's going to solve the problem it's then also important that your domain specific grammar is capable of representing any possible solution in that domain that's capable of uh, solving the problem so as an example of such a tree let's have a look at the problem of evolving uh, boolean expressions where we only have the following functions available we've got or we've got and and we've got not um, and then we also have our terminal nodes which is like the variables x1 and x2 which can only take the values of 0 and 1 there's also some rules that applies for example or has two children uh, same with and and not uh, only has one child and then the terminal leaves like x1 x2 of course has no children whatsoever so this would be uh, the representation of the domain specific grammar in order to evolve boolean expressions okay so second example consider that of evolving a mathematical expression that needs to model some property or um, some some observed you know phenomena um, so it could be represented as, as follows where x a z and 3.5 are all your terminal nodes so they don't have any children and then of course you only also have a set of functions like for example addition multiply divide the natural logarithm and, and so forth so this would be the tree representation of a of a mathematical expression uh, something like this for example um, could be represented in this fashion okay so the initial population for a genetic program um, there's a number of ways this can be done usually the the quickest approach is just to start with a whole bunch of randomly generated trees uh, typically they start very small and then over time they are expanded uh, if no further improvements are possible okay so next of course is the fitness function which tends to be quite problem specific and can be difficult and complex to define because uh, steep cliffs and canyons can arise now this means that uh, small very very small changes in your program can have very huge um, or big changes in your fitness the program has to be executed so typically something like an in order traversal of a of, of the tree itself or some um, you know variation on that and the results of these executions needs to be tested against the set of known test cases and that then use is then used to evaluate how good the program is so both absolute and relative fitnesses can be used in the same uh, fashion as with genetic algorithms the solutions can of course also be penalized if they are, get very deep or very bushy so very wide in other words and um, 
also if they exhibit incorrect grammar. Of course, incorrect grammar can also totally be avoided by requiring that your crossover and mutation only leave you with valid trees. Okay, so for our crossover operators, any of the standard selection strategies can be used, as we've done in the first lecture. Um, and then typically there's two approaches that can be used to generate the offspring. They're pretty much the same um, in the way in which they work. So let's quickly have a look at that. So for example, let's say you've got, um, again, the problem of evolving mathematical expressions. So there's your first parent, here's your second parent, and they need to be used in a crossover operator. So typically what you'll do is you'll select a random node in both the pair, both, both parents and then just swap those subtrees around. So for example, this tree with the multiply is uh, placed on this side and the sin, sin is uh, placed on this side of the, of the second child. And so basically so you just swap those two subtrees around in the offspring. So the mutation operators are usually developed to suit a specific application. Um, there's a number of them. So for example, you have function node mutation where a non-terminal node is replaced by another one with the same arity. So for example, uh, multiplication could be replaced by addition. You have terminal node mutation where a terminal node is selected to replace with another terminal node. Or if it has a value, like for example, seven, that value could be modified. You have a swap mutation where a function node is randomly selected and its children are randomly swapped. Um, there's a few others as well. We have a grow mutation where a terminal node is randomly selected and replaced with a randomly generated subtree. So that increases the tree size. This could also be applied um, with, you know, in very specific instances where if, if no further improvements can be made to the problem. Then you can, for example, say that the grow mutation is allowed for a number of iterations so that the trees can increase in size. A Gaussian mutation, this is similar to that um, where the terminal node is, is replaced or modified, changed. You also have a trunk mutation um, where a whole subtree is replaced by a randomly, term, a randomly selected terminal node. This also has the uh, effect of, of, of decreasing the size of the tree. Okay, a number of asexual operators, in other words, one parent is also defined. Now, this, is, this might seem very similar to mutation. It's a subtle difference. With mutation, that operator is usually applied to a child after something like crossover. And after the mutation has been applied, you, you only have the mutated individual left. With an asexual operator, you typically keep the parent and the child. So in other words, you apply the mutation, if you want to call it mutation, but you make a copy of the parent first. And then you're probably going to replace either the parent or the child based on fitness, or you might have a, some other replacement strategy. Now, there's three uh, asexual operators that, that, that has been defined, can be used. Of course, this is not all of them. So you have your permutation operator, which is similar to a swap function, where a function notes as children undergoes some random permutation. You have an editing operator, where if you have something like x and x, that can be replaced by only x. So it's a, it's a simplification operator, if you like. And then lastly, a building block operator, which is quite interesting. Here, good, bu good building blocks are identified. So it might be, for example, that there's a number of these uh, uh, trees and you find out that there's this one function or one kind of subtree that keeps on arising in the individuals with high fitness. So you can extract that, create a function of that so that you can then just reuse the function without re-evolving the entire subtree every time. It could, for example, a good a, a, an example of that is if you think back about that Boolean expression, um, you know, problem that we've that we've started with, you could, for example, um, extract the XOR function from that um, Boolean tree if if it's a larger function that needs to be evolved, um, and then just reuse that as the building block. Now the Santa Fe Trail problem is an interesting genetic programming exercise in which artificial ants search for food particles that's on some playing grid. Um, there's a specific domain specific language that's defined, things like where the ant can sense uh, food particles in front of it, 
and it can move forwards or backwards, it can turn left and right. There's certain limitations on how it can sense food. Maybe it can only sense one square in front of it. But of course you can also define it that it can sense further. You could add um, you know, properties like memory into the program so that it can remember where it used to be or whether uh, you know it has how many food particles it has picked up for example whatever the case may be and um, then your representation for this is obviously the tree for that domain specific language the fitness function for that would obviously be how many food particles it has uh, collected you could also penalize um, ants that is taking too long to execute or maybe making too many turns or whatever the case may be and of course all the standard crossover mutation can then be applied. So in this specific implementation of the Santa Fe trial problem you can you can actually see how the ants are moving so the initial population are just random programs that, that, that are executed and uh, it's sheer luck that it's able to find any food particles and then over time as, as, as the program progresses it's able to find more and more food particles. So the fit individuals are then used in crossover and mutation, just like we've discussed. And um, in this way, you can evolve a program that's able to find these food particles. Thanks, everyone. So that concludes the genetic programming. Join me in the next video where we'll be having a look at uh, evolutionary programming.